In different parts of the world, food production is suffering due to extreme weather events and prices are skyrocketing. Why is this happening and what will be the implications? The National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers in the UK has been actively organizing against the government's plan to shut down rail ticket offices. Why are the closures being opposed? South Korea's conservative administration is planning to relocate statues of important independence fighters currently placed at the Korean Military Academy. Who are these fighters and why is there a controversy around them? This is the Daily Debrief. These are our stories for the day. And before you go any further, if you are watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit the subscribe button. In India, record low monsoons have taken a toll on crop production, including that of rice. India is otherwise the biggest rice exporter in the world, but now the country has banned most of its rice exports. Similar weather in Australia has cast a pall on wheat production. Production of other essential crops such as soybean, palm oil and corn is also expected to take a hit. All of this can have serious implications for food security as well as hunger, which is already on the rise. To find out more on why this is happening, we go to D. Raghunandan from the Delhi Science Forum. So, Raghu, uh, huge rainfall deficits are being cited as the reason behind this fall in crop production, which includes wheat and rice. And uh, many climate experts are saying that th this is because of El Nino, but some are also saying that this is a confluence of climate change and El Nino. Can you tell us what is happening? So, let me first uh, explain globally the changes in climate patterns and particularly with regard to rainfall and what is the El Nino uh, phenomenon. Uh, there are two phenomena, related phenomena in uh, the Pacific uh, Ocean, uh, which are changes in the patterns of ocean currents and their temperatures. Uh, and these reflect uh, large-scale climate phenomena, which are not perhaps global, but spread over large parts of the world, uh, large regions of the world, uh, if you like. Now, El Nino and its counterpart, La Nina, uh, which is the female version, is the baby, uh, are uh, changes in temperatures of these ocean uh, currents, El Nino, where it gets warmer, and La Nina when it is when the temperature drops. Uh, and when this phenomenon happens, either way, then it influences rainfall patterns uh, across regions uh, and parts of the world. Uh, and usually, El Nino is associated with uh, rainfall less than normal. And La Nina is associated with extreme, with excess rainfall. But then with climate change added on uh, to this, then the excess rainfall may sit on top of the extreme rainfall events that we are used to from climate change. And El Nino may uh, uh, counter the extreme rainfall uh, events and result in droughts. Now, if you look at what's happening in India uh, uh, today, uh, with regard to La Nina, this, this, we've had two to three years of continuous La Nina activities in the Southern Pacific uh, Ocean. This year, we have had an El Nino coming in towards the latter half of the monsoon uh, period. And it was widely expected that this would result in below normal uh, rainfall in the subcontinent. However, what has happened is because of the overlay of El Nino and climate change, uh, what has happened is, as I was telling you, uh, we have had in India uh, excess rainfall in the northern parts of the country. and a uh, shortfall uh, in the monsoon rains in peninsular India. 
particularly over southern Maharashtra, Karnataka, uh, parts of Tamil Nadu, uh, etc. Now, there's one more phenomenon that has happened which has influenced rainfall patterns uh, in the subcontinent this year. And that is the tropical cyclones on the Arabian Sea. Now, what has happened is the latest tropical cyclone on the Arabian, over the Arabian Sea was expected to hit the southern part of the country, but started drifting northwards towards Bombay, Karachi, the Bay uh, area. And along with it, it then drags uh, low pressure uh, zones. There's already heat accumulating in northern India because of the normal summer, etc. So you have dry air on top, but you have cyclone coming up, bringing with it moisture. This moisture accumulates the heat conditions also evaporates water faster. So the dry upper atmosphere accumulates a huge amount of water. And then when it encounters the appropriate weather conditions, it pours, which is why you've had these huge rains over Himachal, Uttarakhand, uh, etc. And earlier on from the cyclone, of course, you had the rains over Pakistan, uh, etc. So as I was saying, this is a combination of several factors. It's a combination of El Nino. It's a combination of the tropical cyclone over the Arabian Sea, which itself, by the way, is a um, rather uh, recent phenomena of increased number of cyclones in the Arabian Sea, which may be ascribed to climate change. Mm -hmm. So you've got the cyclone, you've got El Nino, and you've got a weather pattern of extreme heat, which is drawing water up into the atmosphere, storing it, and then coming down uh, like that. So in coming back to uh, the subject of uh, food grain production, uh, it is expected and is a long-term uh, prediction under climate change IPCC's fifth assessment report, sixth assessment report have all uh, projected that the Indian subcontinent will suffer from a drop of uh, food grain production, particularly wheat and rice. Uh, it is looking as if it may affect rice more than wheat, but these are uh, early days yet. We still do not have sufficient statistical evidence to show which way uh, it's going to go because there are so many regional variations over India. But it does look as if there is going to be a drop in crop uh, production. One small point I'd like to add is the concern is not only about drop in crop production. The changes in rainfall pattern, the changes in temperature patterns, particularly the not-so-cold winters, and slightly higher daytime temperatures during the winter season, these are likely to result not only in lower crop uh, output, but also in the protein composition of the crop. So you may get nice looking wheat, but if you examine it, you will find that the protein content has dropped. So this is likely to result not only in drop of productivity of wheat, but also drop in the nutritional uh, quality of the wheat or rice that we obtain as a result of climate change. But as I said, not all the data is in. We'll have to observe what happens over the next five to 10 years. And along with regional variations, then we may get a better picture. Over the past year, the RMT or the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers in the UK has been campaigning against the plans of the government and train companies to shut down all 1,000 ticket offices across the country. The union says that while the government is trying to sell this as modernization, it is actually an attempt to further de-staff railway stations. Public consultations on this move will end on September 1st and right before this, the RMT has called for a march to 10 Downing Street to save ticket offices. Let's go to Anish for more on this story. 
Sonia, can you start by telling us how does the government and these railway companies stand to benefit from this move of uh, closing rail ticket offices and uh, why is the RMT opposing it? Well, uh, like the closure of rail ticketing offices as a government and obviously the private uh, the, the private contractors who are running the railways at the moment, uh, the argument for them is that uh, it is primarily because of how uh, the, the behavior of customers of buying tickets of passengers of buying tickets have changed over time and how most people about like more than 90 percent in many places have uh, chosen uh online or uh you know automatic uh, ticketing systems or machines uh and uh, favoring that over uh rail tickets so uh sorry ticketing counters and that uh this it is only the small number that is being catered to and so for them it is unprofitable but the problem is that uh, it's they speak as of the most of these rail t- railway ticket encounters run like 24 24 7 uh all through the day uh that's not how it works they pretty much uh run for a few couple of hours at least especially in small count uh, country uh railway stations so they pretty much run for just a couple of hours uh, a day and it mostly benefits uh senior citizens and dis- people with disabilities so this closure of uh, this demand to close down about more than thousand uh, ticketing offices uh, is something that is going to a pretty much uh, push out these people, the most vulnerable passengers who still depend on railways uh, more than any other uh, you know modes of public transport, uh, and for whom railways continues to be the most accessible form of uh, transport uh being completely left out in the cold and obviously job losses uh running into hundreds maybe in thousands uh for a whole lot of people and that is something and with no replacement there's no uh, pay package there's no severance package no replacement of or even uh, attempts to absorb these people who will lose jobs uh by the closure of these railway ticket uh, ticketing officers and counters, uh, and that is something that uh, pretty much affects not just the workers but also passengers. Now, this is something that RMT has brought out the fact that a it is also about a job loss, and you know, uh, apart from other demands that they are uh, putting out in the current set of strikes, uh, which includes pay rise and you know, uh, addressing inflation. Uh, but it's also about the fact that uh, the railways is increasingly being turned into a more like a luxury product uh, at the behest of uh, private uh, railway companies by the conservative government uh, rather than as a public utility that is necessary for most people to continue uh, and for use as a public mode of transport. Right. Can you tell us more about the demands of the RMT and, you know, how is the government uh, trying to justify this, justify this and how is it trying to, you know, what kind of response has they, have they given to, to the RMT's demands? Well, at the moment right now, what we're seeing is a very, uh, you know, lukewarm, like lukewarm is not just a very mild way to put it, pretty much a complete uh, negligence on the part of the government to address uh, workers' demands at this moment. Uh, but, and the, and this is something that not just uh, rail workers have brought up. This is something that everybody has brought up. The fact that UK has gone through some of the worst, uh, outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic in the developed world. And, uh, and it is only, it is one of the few places in the Western world that actually faced, uh, a double digit inflation. Like at this point, uh, since 2021, uh, wages have pretty much real wages have completely declined across sectors and uh, and it's not just the railways but especially for uh, public service workers uh, but, and you have seen uh, price hikes uh, going by up to 12 to 13 percent at under current estimates in the last two years and that is primarily because of the outcomes of the covid-19 the the level of mismanagement of the economy aside that is pretty much the charge that has been put up against the, both the Boris Johnson government, but also under Rishi Sunak, who was a also the one who had led the counter pandemic program uh, under the Johnson government. Uh, in both cases, uh, this uh, this is just 
one part of the issue, like, but also significantly uh, important for the railway workers at this current point of time. So addressing like uh, the current set of proposals that the rail companies have given is pretty much uh, just going to have a very small, meager uh, uh, change in wages. Uh, we are looking at something like 12% or 13% rise at the minimum, which is not enough considering that, as, as I pointed out, like price hike uh, has happened over uh, the last few years has been about 13 percent pretty much we are looking at real decline in wages uh, and that is not going to address this this is going to keep wages stagnant in most ways it is also going to not address any of the issues that is uh, that comes along with the cost of living crisis that is still spiraling in the uk unlike most places in the world it is still a big massive problem over there and rail workers obviously are one of the the worst affected because they were also the ones who were on the front lines of uh, you know managing the economy at the time and there has been no uh, wage hikes in the past four years uh, for them and this uh, and this is pretty much a situation where uh, like and, and we are also looking obviously at the time when public transport has been generally affected and the government is trying to use that as an excuse Rather than to modernize the system with greater investment, they're going to cut down and they're going to try to push it into, you know, uh, leisure travelers, uh, targeting them rather than, uh, you know, uh, you know, doubling down the public utility factor of the railway system in, in itself. So that is pretty much what the RMT has also pointed out. The fact that the government is uh, pretty much just doubling down on its stand of cutting down of austerity at a time when workers are suffering so heavily. Right, thanks Anisha and we'll be back to you again shortly. In South Korea, the Defense Ministry has said it is planning on relocating statues of five Korean independence fighters. This includes Hong Wong Do, an important leader who was also associated with the Soviet Communist Party. This announcement has sparked debates and controversy. Critics have denounced this move as an attempt to wipe out the legacy of the preceding liberal administration of Moon Jae-in. We are joined again by Anish for more details. So Anish, can you start by telling us about, you know, who these uh, independence fighters are and why uh, is the government planning to, you know, relocate their statues? What is behind this move? Yeah, so uh, let's begin with the fact that these busts uh, that were placed at the military academy uh, were uh, placed in 2018 uh, as part of uh, expanding the memorial for freedom fighters under the Moon Jae-in government, the previous uh, government, uh, and uh, pretty much uh, it commemorated heroes that were otherwise, uh, well, while they were uh, widely recognized as heroes, they were still not taken into consideration in official uh, commemorations because of their associations with the communist movement and obviously uh, the Soviet army and the Chinese military who were also part of the resistance uh against the japanese imperialists and so these four figures especially hong Bondu, was pretty much at the forefront of uh such resistance a very partisan resistance obviously supported by the soviet union and the uh, and the communists in china and in many ways this uh collaboration of like an internationalist collaboration of communists were uh at the heart of uh like uh, of the liberation of Korea altogether. It was not just uh, the defeat of Japanese by Americans, but also the fact that uh, average Koreans took to uh, a popular struggle against the Japanese imperialists uh, who pretty much wreaked havoc in their country, not just during the war, but before as well, the decades leading to the war as well. So uh, Hong Wang Do was one of them. He, uh, he was somebody who was well known to have uh, fought uh, in, like guerrilla fashion, uh, had taken, uh, you know, lessons from the Chinese communists, had worked and even stayed in the Soviet Union where he died eventually. Uh, but uh, he is still considered one of the greatest heroes of the Korean independence. And definitely the commemoration was something that many conservatives did not really uh, take uh, lightly or, you know, did not take very kindly to. And that is pretty much at the heart of this relocation move. Their whole argument is that because the Korean constitution or the, the South Korean constitution, which calls it the Republic of Korea, 
uh, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, establishing a state of uh, liberal and a free market state uh, is uh, not in uh, line with the ideological. And they're very clearly saying that this is pretty much because of ideological differences with these uh, historical figures that they want to relocate them away from the military academy. But they were military strategists and freedom fighters who led were part of the Korean Independence Army. And so the this argument does not really uh, matter when you consider the fact that the army is supposed to be ideally non-ideological. So this ideological question is pretty much at the heart of the problem here right now. And can you also comment on this uh, rising trend of anti-communism under the current uh, South Korean dispensation? Yeah, so there has always been uh, this uh, tendency, at least under go conservative governments, to undermine the communist history in the Korean Peninsula, uh, primarily because it is pretty much something that was carried over from the Cold War era uh, history when South Korea was also under a dictatorship, a pro-US di dictatorship, much less, and which also witnessed several multiple uh, anti-communist massacres in its time. Uh, many of which still remain underreported or not taken into consideration and are still being litigated uh, in the courts. That aside, uh, the, the conservatives and the hardcore conservatives that Yoon, Yoon Suk Yeol, the current president, uh, is part of, uh, has never taken kindly to that history. Uh, they have been vehemently uh, anti-communist uh, very clearly in their public lives and their past as well. And so for them to actually take this move is not really surprising. And we have also seen that, like how that actually affects a lot of Korean national interest, because obviously they have treaded into a point where uh, where they are undermining uh, nationalist history uh, because of ideological differences, and that is something that has struck a chord across Korean uh, public. And also, and let's remember, this is coming at a time when uh, the Korean government, the South Korean government, has bent over backwards to accommodate Japanese uh, 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 cons considerations, especially in the release of Fukushima waters. And that has also not gone, gone down well with the public. So this is pretty much another hot topic issue that they have brought themselves into. And this is going to really backfire at this point in time. Right. Thanks, Anish, for joining us. And this is all we have in this episode of The Daily Debrief. For more details on these stories and for other such stories, Visit our website peoplesdispatch.org and our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram for more video updates. Visit our YouTube page. Thank you for watching.